Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Javier Pinilla. I'm a um, hematologist, oncologist at the Aisley Muffy Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida, where I do mainly um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, although I head the lymphoma program there. And I'm here to, to discuss the latest updates in the ASH uh, 2023 meeting. And I have the pleasure to have uh, Amber Conner, who is coming from the Mayo Clinic. So I'm going to really um, make her introduce herself. Um, Amber, please. Wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Amber Kaler, and I'm a PA who practices in CLL at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Wonderful. Great, Amber. So, so today um, in, this, um, in this program, in this um, CLL Society programs, uh, we're going to discuss with Amber a poster, a very interesting poster that she presented at the ASH meeting, uh, Outcomes of Patients with a Small Lymphocytic Lymphoma Receiving First-Line Therapy, a very, very, very large retrospective analysis of patients treated at the Mayo for many years. So I think uh, I want her to, to start and, and really give me a summary of your presentation. Amber. Yeah, absolutely. So this was work that was led by my colleague, uh, Dr. Kosadar. And what we looked at was if we could do a retrospective chart review of patients specifically with SLL, right? So as you've alluded to, in the current classification systems, CLL and SLL are considered to be the same entity. But I think as we're evolving in our treatment for CLL, the question becomes, is this a distinction that's important in terms of how people respond to treatment? And so what he found was about 182 patients, the way they defined SLL was the presence of lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly, either by physical exam or CT scans, with an absolute clonal B cell count of less than 5 times 10 to the ninth. If that absolute clonal B cell count wasn't available, they utilized an absolute lymphocyte count of less than 10 times 10 to the ninth. And what they looked at was, you know, kind of a couple pieces. So one was what were the indications for frontline treatment? And they bucketed that into a few categories, specifically symptomatic or progressive lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly, autoimmune cytopenias, extranodal or direct organ infiltration, or other. And other captured many, many things, cryoglobulinemia, perineoplastic syndromes, uh, non-infiltrative renal diseases, such as minimal change disease and the like. And what they found was that the most common indication for treatment in patients who met that criteria for a definition of SLL was symptomatic or progressive lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly, which I would say has been pretty on par with our practice. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, how, <clears throat> so I see that that uh, in the presentation, you guys really well. I, I'm very, very glad to see such a long retrospective analysis. I believe it's coming almost for the 2000s, something like that, more than 20 years, 1995, if I recall, right? But it's um, one of maybe is the largest databases that is really right now in SLL. I think one of the interesting thing is that, as you may remember, in the old times, SLL was really placed in, in the clinical trial with um, low-grade lymphomas, and obviously the realization that was the same as uh, CLL, they start to really incorporate it. But but right now, when we see the, the, the new target agents that has revolutionized the treatment of CLL, so sometimes I, I do believe that we put in the same bag, but but I, I I truly believe that could be difference even with the new target therapy. So so what is your 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 take on on this aspect? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you know the study showed what we've seen over and over again in the trials, right? Which is that people with SLL do better with the novel oral targeted therapies. I think it's challenging to make sweeping generalizations about one targeted therapy being better than the other because they were such small numbers uh, to compare, say, BTK inhibitors versus BCL2 inhibitor-based therapy. Um, certainly, the longest overall survival was with uh, the, nor the novel oral targeted therapies. Uh, it wasn't actually evaluable compared to the other treatments, right? Uh, but certainly also the longest treatment-free survival. 
I think it's challenging to, to tease that out in the study. I can say clinically, uh, my impression, and I'm curious what your thoughts are, but my impression clinically is that the BTK inhibitors seem to be more effective in the nodal compartments, whereas the BCL2-based regimens seem to get that deeper MRD negative remission more quickly. But of course, we've also seen the data from E1912, which shows that just because you're not MRD negative doesn't mean you can't uh, have prolonged remissions. So I'm excited about the ongoing nature of this study, and, and hopefully we can continue to tease that out as we get more and more patients to enroll in it. Well, I think you have a phenomenal point, and I completely share with you these, these thoughts, right? I do believe that the nodal disease in CLL, um, you know, overall do very, very well with um, with BTK because as we know, BTK has a, an excellent effect in the nodal compartment. However, as you just pointed out, these days you cannot say that we cannot offer the same um, alternative to our patient because we now, all of them really works uh, phenomenal. But but in my practice, I also share these, these thoughts that sometimes I lean towards a little more BTK in those patients where I really more leukemic kind of uh, classical SLL with really, really severe cytopenias. My goal is to really empty the bone marrow with more uh, cytotoxic agents, right? Uh, as you just pointed out, uh, we still don't know what's going to happen in the future. Now, trials that are compared to time-limited therapy versus therapy until progression. Now we have the new combination of BTK, BCL2 that, well, we have seen many, many data discussed with the I plus B, but definitely, you know, the, the, the broad use of the second generation is going to bring more data, hopefully in the next year with the magic and, and another really Akala combos. But but there is no doubt that this like um, from this perspective is is very interesting. And sometimes when we see the the trials, and I think it's something that, in my opinion, I would love to 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 have your take. When you see the trials that overall been treated CLL SLL, sometimes they don't really go deep about why we treat patients or why why people in the old ibrutinib trials may may really discuss that. But these days. I'm missing more the granularity of say, oh, how, how the patients with mainly nodal disease behave compared, let's say, how patients with uh, cytopenias behave with BTKs. And and because in my opinion, this is what some of the issues that we may see in the in our practice. What, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, a few thoughts. I think we're starting to see that cutoff of about five centimeters, the bulky adenopathy showing up more and more as a prognostic factor. So I think that plays into the discussion. I think the other challenge is that sometimes I'm not convinced that the fish findings in the nodes are always exactly the same as the fish in the peripheral blood, right? And we've seen that sometimes there can be discordance there. So, you know, in this study, we utilized the fish from the peripheral blood, and they found that the trisomy 12 was the most common uh, finding on the fish in the blood. It will be interesting, you know, as we move forward and we look more at, you know, whether or not that might be different in the nodal compartment, that may play into, you know, those factors as well. That That's a really, really great point that you make, because in, in my practice, I'm sure happening in your practice, we typically see patients who come to you being diagnosed many, many times uh, incidentally of SLL upon some kind of surgery. So they, the pathologists don't really have the time to really send for this genetic analysis, IJHB on fish. And then we, we even with normal, normal, normal um, labs, apparently normal labs, we try to identify these, these anormalities in the blood. And we, we sometimes we, we find them, right? We find it. But as you, you now, as, as something that's applicable to mutation, sometimes we see this discrepancy about lack of uh, BTK mutation in the blood and really mutation in the lymph node. So I, I do share that it may be a different, different beast in the lymph nodes because the lymph nodes are the one, the drivers of the disease itself, right? So I think that that really, really an excellent point. Right. So so just to, to, to wrap up and, and to summarize, what do you think is your last you know, check on makes message of this of this presentation for for the you know for the patient in general for the public. Yeah, I think in my mind the take home message is that you know although CLL and SLL are considered to be the same entity in the current classification systems, I think that patients with CLL do warrant some special nuances and attention in their clinical management. 
Certainly, I see that we're continuing to see improved outcomes with the novel oral targeted agents that are perhaps less novel these days, uh, even though we continue to use that term. And that I'm excited to see in the years to come how we might be able to further fine tune our treatments and our choice of oral targeted agent based on if it's more of an SLL picture versus a more of a traditional CLL picture. Phenomenal. Well, thank thank you so much for for sharing this this uh, abstract with uh, with the CLL Society, and I'm looking forward to see more data from from you and your group. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.